we are being compared to the hardliners in Iran because we have concerns. Concerns that we are trying to have answered. He's trying to shut down debate by saying those who have questions, legitimate questions, legitimate questions, are somehow unpatriotic. President Obama has made the battle for his Iranian nuclear deal personal, slamming away at Republicans and opposition by comparing them to Iranian terrorists who always scream death to America, promising that without this deal, his deal, there will be war, flying in the face of those who insist that with this agreement there will be war no matter what we or anyone else hopes for. Add the elements of American drones bombing away in Syria from Turkish air bases, you already have a war and much more in the offing. Let's welcome back the former CIA operative who has spent more than 20 years digging intelligence dirt in the Middle East and Latin America, Gary Bernson, joined by director of the National Security Program at the Bipartisan Policy Center, Blaise Mistal. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Gary, I'm going to begin with you on this one. The president spits it right out. Republicans and everybody else are just as bad as those screaming death to America. He's promising war. Wait a minute. It would seem that we've got war on the doorstep no matter what we do at this time. It's clearly not helpful, his statements. Republicans are concerned that the Iranians will abide by the agreement. The president and his team worked very hard to put agreement together, and there are legitimate concerns. Will the Iranians fess up to the military advancements that they've made? Are there holes in the agreement? Because there's lots of discussion about, you know, being able to have, you know, having individuals there, inspectors on scene. But did anyone ever think about the fact that the Iranians will go to North Korea and develop programs in Pyongyang side by side with the North Koreans? There's lots of holes here. There's legitimate concerns, and the president's really out of bounds because... You know, what we all want is peace. We want to find a way forward to stabilize the Middle East and protect our interests. All right. Now, Blaze, there's a point that Gary makes. Look, nobody wants to go to war. We don't need this. I mean, we're already warred out in this country. And what may happen in the Middle East frightens a whole lot of people here. But isn't there something better that we can do instead of being pushed to the wall by the mullahs, by the Ayatollah, and basically bowing down to them and handing them the cash? Look, I think both sides are getting this debate a little bit wrong. The president comparing critics of the deal to Iranian hardliners are saying that anybody who doubts the deal is like those who supported the Iraq war is misleading and I think unproductive. Uh, And this debate about whether we could get a better deal is a bit of a counterfactual. Could there have been a better deal? Could we have done more to get a better deal? It's very likely Congress wanted more sanctions. There was the possibility of more coercive diplomacy being used to get a better deal. But the fact of the matter is that this is the deal the president has negotiated, and he's basically told us he's not going to go back and ask for something better. He's not going to try to hold our allies together and keep sanctions off Iran. He's going to let this deal go forward and sanctions get loose, uh, get lifted, regardless of what happens in Congress. But I hear... So the question is... No, please, go ahead. So the question is, how do we rein in the consequences of this deal and what the president is allowing to happen? Blaze, I think one of the things, and Gary, I'm going to ask you about this as well, because I think that this really struck a lot of people. When John Kerry came out in the Atlantic and said, the Ayatollah constantly believed that we are untrustworthy, that you can't negotiate with us, that we will screw them, this will be the ultimate screwing. Blaze, I'll tell you what, when John Kerry talks about the risk of Congress screwing the Ayatollah, nobody here in America wants to hear that. I mean, come on, you're telling us that we're going to get in trouble screwing the guy who basically has said to America, hey, look, death to you will bring out the bombs in the war whenever we can. That's, it, it just seems to me that Kerry is driving this rhetoric to a new level with that. I think it definitely seems that the president is doing more to try to uh, keep the Iranians happy with this deal than really address the domestic debate at this point. Look, we've known that Congress is going to vote on this deal for the better part of three months at this point. It's always been clear that that would be part of the process. The Iranians have, know it, have known it. There's you know, I, I don't think there's any sort of deceit going forward by saying Congress gets a chance to either approve or disapprove of this deal. Uh, that's simply the way our, our process works. And guess what? The deal also includes the a provision for the Iranians to take it to their parliament. Uh, so, you know, if that democracy, the great democracy that is Iran, gets to vote on it, I think it's only fair for the president and his administration to let us do so as well. Gary, right to you on this one, too. I'll tell you, I, I think, was shocked. Well, I, was, I, think, I wanted I to get your that, opinion. I think that uh, Secretary Kerry fails to understand history. The fact is, is that there are $19 billion in judgments against the Iranian government for murdering, torturing, savaging American citizens. They haven't had to pay it because they're protected under the sovereign, uh, the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act. 
So when Kerry's talking about, you know, fearful that we're going to screw the Iranians, you know, the Iranians up to this moment continue to plan lethal operations against Americans where they believe it will intimidate America or push it back. The Iranians have never stopped this. So please, uh, you know, knock off the nonsense, Mr. Kerry. Let's get down to looking at the agreement here. We're going to have a vote. Unfortunately, the Senate flipped this over. It should have been considered as a treaty. There should have been 66 or 67 votes would have been needed to approve it. Instead, we have to have that many to, to block the agreement. The Senate didn't didn't set this up very well. All right, a couple of minutes we have left here. Blaze, let me come to you on the secondary issue that I mentioned as well. There was a U.S. armed drone that bombed a target in ISIS-controlled northern Syria. It took off from Turkish territory. It would seem to me and many other people that, look, we already are at war, and this is another necessary escalation in going after ISIS. Would you agree? I certainly would. I think the shame is that it's taken us almost a year to get access to Turkish bases, even though Turkey is a NATO ally. Um, but they've been far more interested in prosecuting uh, the Kurds in Syria and actually helping some of the extremists in Syria than, than teaming up with, with their, their treaty allies to go after ISIS. Uh, ironically enough, ISIS is the one area where U.S. and Iran find themselves on the same side. Uh, but throughout the Middle East, we see conflicts that are being funded, supported, and fueled by Iran, whether it's supporting the Assad regime in, in, in Syria, Hamas or Hezbollah, or the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Uh, and so, you know, we are at least uh, at arm's length engaged in conflicts with, with Iran already, and figuring out how we're going to c try to contain those as this deal goes forward is going to be a big challenge. And Gary, if you add to that that now the U.S. Navy is not going to have an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf for much of the fall season because they've been on station for so long now, they have to actually come in for maintenance. Look, we've got Iran sitting on the stage right now getting ready for us, it would seem. Now we have the Turks getting involved with ISIS in Syria and not to have an aircraft carrier there. Gary, I know that some people will say it's no big deal, but isn't this huge? You, you always want to have that capacity uh, in the Persian Gulf. The, the fact, though, that Incirlik has been opened in southern Turkey and it gives us greater hover time over ISIS targets is a great improvement in the tactical situation in terms of us fighting ISIS. Uh, we've got uh, eight or nine uh, uh, aircraft carriers. It's inexcusable that they would have planned so poorly, given the importance of the region, uh, not to have a carrier on standby. That's just that's not good management. It's just awful management, logistical management. Gary, 30 seconds quickly on this. And to that point, would you then probably not be shocked at all if ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and every other group is sitting there and they are looking at their watch right now going, okay, three, two, one, they left today, let's go to work. Well, the, the, the great threat here now for, for ISIS and for the, for the West is that the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, is vulnerable. You've got large numbers of people in Kuwait and in Saudi Arabia on social media communi communicating with ISIS. We're getting ready for a fight here in the GCC. It's going to be an internal battle. And those countries are going to be in a fight with many of their own citizens that have been turned and are cooperating with ISIS. We look in the United States and we recognize that we've had individuals do, you know, being motivated to do attacks. The problem in the, in the Gulf Cooperation Council in the Persian Gulf is much greater. Blaze, 20 seconds to you quickly. Do you also fear that that's, they're just sitting there now waiting? Yeah, and I would add to that that the threat to, to our Sunni Arab allies is not just from ISIS, but also from Iran, which has tried to foment unrest among their Shia mi minorities, whether it's in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, or other countries, uh, for the last 30 years and yep. are likely to do so again. So, so there could be a, a perfect storm of conflict coming to the Middle East. Bad planning and bad leadership again. Gary Bernson, Blaise Mistal, thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. We'll do it again. The Hardline continues.